Welcome to the Process Breakdown Podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks, and giving your employees all the information they need to be successful at their jobs. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, John Corcoran here, host of the Process Breakdown Podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks, and giving your staff everything they need to be successful at their job. Some of our past guests include David Allen of Getting Things Done and Michael Gerber of The E-Myth and many more. And before I get into today's guest, just a quick sponsor message. This is brought to you by Sweet Process. Have you ever had team members ask you the same question over and over again, and it's the 10th time you spent explaining it? Well, there's a better way in a solution. Sweet Process is a software that makes it drop dead easy to train and onboard new staff and save time with existing staff. Not only, not only do universities, banks, hospitals, and software companies use them, but first responder government agencies use them as well. You can use Sweet Process to document all the repetitive tasks they did up your precious time so you can focus on growing your team and empowering them to do their best work. You can sign up for a free 14-day trial, no credit card required. Go to sweetprocess.com, sweet like candy, S-W-E-E-T, process. Dot com. All right, so I'm excited today. We have Michelle Seiler Tucker. She is the founder and CEO of Seiler Tucker Incorporated. She holds the Mergers and Acquisitions Master Intermediary title, as well as Certified Mergers and Acquisitions Professional and Certified Senior Business Analyst. Michelle also owns many other businesses in several different industries. As a 20-year veteran in the M&A industry, she's regarded as the leading authority on buying, selling, fixing, and growing businesses. Her and her firm have sold over a thousand businesses in almost every vertical, have a remarkable track record of success. Her forthcoming book with her co-author Sharon Lecter is Exit Rich, The 6P Method for Selling Your Business for a Huge Profit. She also has a foreword by with Kevin Harrington of Shark Tank, which is really cool. So we're going to dive into that book. Uh, but Michelle, I'll give people a, a brief overview of who you are and what you do, but, but give us a little bit more context about what you're focused on these days and, and what you do. Sure. So I specialize in mergers and acquisitions, been in business for, been in this industry for a little over 20, about 20 years. My firm has sold over a thousand businesses. Uh, we specialize in buying, selling, fixing, and growing companies. And I, what I'm working on right now is my book launch, which is the launch of my book, Exit Rich. Yeah. And so there are six P's perfectly fit. Uh, so it starts with people. So break us down, break that down for us, uh, how you think about that dimension. Sure. So every business, you know, before I break it down, let me give you a little history, because I think it's important to know, you know, what business's biggest mistakes are and what the biggest issues are. When I wrote my first book in 2013 called Sell Your Business for More Than It's Worth, I did the research and learned that about 95% of all startups would fail, right? We all know that. Um, so that's nothing new. However, when I wrote Exit Rich in 2019 and 2020, I did this exact same research and was flabbergasted to learn that the business landscape has actually flip-flopped. So now it's only 30% of startups, those one through five years, will fail. Only 30%. So this is a good time for startups. Mm. However, out of 27.6 million companies, those businesses have been in business for 10 years or longer, 70% of them will go out of business, 70. Now, you've probably heard about the big public companies like Toys R Us in business 75 years goes out of business. Kmart, Steinmart, Pier 1, Godiva is closing down 1,500 locations. But what you're not hearing about are all the businesses private businesses on every street corner in every town and every state across our great nation, these businesses, unfortunately, are exiting poor. They're having to sell their business for pennies on the dollar. They're having to close their business or even worse, file bankruptcy. So that's really the reason why I wrote Exit Rich to begin with. And also what Steve Forbes says is very true. Eight out of 10 businesses don't sell. That's 80%. So 70% of business going out of business and eight out of 10 businesses don't sell. And two reasons for that, well, probably a lot more reasons for that, but the biggest reason is that business owners don't plan their exit. You know, I, I call this their exit strategy. They should plan their exit, you know, really from day one of starting or buying a business, believe it or not, because most business owners never think about selling a business until an internal or external catastrophic event occurs. So internal meaning health issues, divorce, partner disputes, et cetera. External is this pandemic. 
And that's really the, the worst time to sell your business. The other big mistake that business owners make is they are the business. They have created a glorified job in which they go to work at every day rather than a business that actually works for them. So we help business owners plan their ST GPS exit model. And then we help them build the infrastructure on the six P's, the first P being people, because that's one of the biggest problems. If a business is tied to the owner, it's very difficult to sell. Not impossible, but extremely difficult, and you will never maximize value. We had a dentist that came to us that wants to sell his business, been in business 45 years, one dentist, mm. three dental hygienists. And I told him, I said, we can sell your business, but you're going to have to stay on for two to three years. And he's like, I'm not staying. I'm burned out. I'm ready to leave. And I said, well, if you leave, your patients leave. So you really want to build a business that is sustainable, scalable, can run without you. So the first P is people. You don't build a business. You build people and people build the business. So you have to have the right people in the right seats and you have to ask the who question. Who opens the door? Who does with clients? Marketing, accounting, legal, manufacturing, transportation, environmental. The, the clue here, John, is you, John, should never be next to the who. Because <laughs> you really want the business to run without you. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so many businesses are tied to the owners. And when you take the owner out of that business, there is no business. Mm, mm. So you have someone who comes to you who has that problem. It's too tied to them. And how do you get them to change that? Or is it sometimes too late? Well, it's never too late. The only time it's too late is if an owner is burned out, exhausted, tired, and can't do it anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and you know, people do reach their burnout phase, right? We're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this another day. And that doesn't happen. And at that point, it's too late. But other than, you know, burnout is really not too late. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always things that you can do. The number one thing you need to do is, is get people. You got to, entrepreneurs need to focus on their strength and hire their weaknesses. Mm, yeah. So, um, so people's number one. And the next one is product. Tell, take us through that one. Sure. So product is your industry, your service. And you, you really have to look at your product and ask yourself, are you on the way up? Or are you on the way out? Or is your product, your service, your industry, is that thriving or is it dying? Do you have an Amazon or do you have a blockbuster? Mm. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, there are a lot of industries out there that are a bust right now. And so that doesn't mean, though, that you just close up, close up your business and go home. That means you really got to align yourself with a mentor, with an expert to help you figure it out. And I always tell my clients, you really should ask, ask yourself these three transformational questions. Amazon did this back in the 90s. Amazon asked themselves, what business are we in? And I said, oh, we're in the business of selling books. Well, business owners should be asking themselves, what business are we in? Then the second question is, what what do you do really well, better than everyone else, better than your competitors? And Amazon said, we're the best at fulfillment. That's what we do better than everybody else. And so the third question, the most obvious question is, what business should we be in? Hmm. And Amazon said, oh my gosh, we need to be in a fulfillment business and not just fulfillment book sales, but fulfilling everybody's products. And as simple as it sounds, those three transformational questions is what really transitioned, transformed Amazon from a small bookseller to a multi-billion dollar worldwide conglomerate that they are today. That's so great. Those three questions. All right. So people, number one, product, number two. And then, and then you got processes. Process. Okay. So processes, John, are kind of like, kind of like extra strategy. <laughs> Business owners don't think about their processes until something happens. And they're like, oh my gosh, somebody just got hurt on the manufacturing floor. We need a process for that. <laughs> no, you needed a process before that. <laughs> so you really got to you got you got to look at your processes. But the thing that you should really determine is what do you want your customer experience to be? What do you want your customers to get when they come to your business? How do you want them to feel? You know, McDonald's did this back in the forties. I don't know if you ever watched the movie The Founder. Oh, great it's, movie! Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, great movie, yeah. right? Yeah. So back in the forties, McDonald's said. We want to create a, because back then it was like the sonic type drive ups and the food was always cold. It was always wrong. It Inconsistent. Wrong. Yeah. So McDonald's said, let's create a fast food restaurant around the customer experience. We want to create the processes around the customer experience. We want the customer to experience great tasting food, hot, mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. So remember they went out to the tennis course, they took the chalk and they drew yep. it all out. I remember that was a great practice. scene. Yeah. Yeah. They're running they around figuring out the most efficient way to do it. Yeah. They figured out who takes the order, who mm -hmm. toasts the buns, who cooks the burgers, who puts the pickles on the buns and gives it to the client and to 
minutes or less. So those processes is why you can eat at a McDonald's anywhere in the world. Those processes is why you can lose somebody at the register at the front and replace them like that. Yeah. Because they have the processes in place designed with the customer experience in mind. How many businesses have you done business with? And you're like, oh, my God, I would never do business with them again. This is the worst experience ever. Right. Right. Because right, they have I can name a really big bank and I can name a social media company. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so their processes are based upon their own agenda. Same thing with like chiropractors and doctors and things like that. What do they do? Chiropractors are notorious to say, oh, I'm open Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 9 to 1 or 9 to 12, closed from 12 to 3, open again at 3 to 5. Mm-hmm. Who can ever remember that? Yeah, so you really yeah. want to design your processes around a customer experience. They need to be productive, efficient, and they need to be documented. I mean, you got to have policy and procedure manuals. You got to have the SOP checklist. You have to have those employee handbooks and those employee non-competes. Right, right. And living, breathing documents that you can use as well. So process and then proprietary. So explain that one. Yeah, so proprietary is the highest value driver. So this is, if you're not listening to anything else I said, listen to this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Proprietary is the most uh, highest value driver. So companies that have under a million dollars in EBITDA, EBITDA is earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Under a million dollars in EBITDA, those businesses typically trade for anywhere from one to four times multiple. Businesses of over a million dollars in EBITDA typically go for five and up multiple. Now, if you want a six, a seven, eight, a 10 multiple, then you need to build these proprietary assets. Number one is branding. The more well-branded, these are synergies. The more well-branded you are, the more I can sell your company for, as long as your brand is relevant in the mind of the consumer. Is anybody buying Blockbuster? Is anybody going to buy that brand? Absolutely not. The most valuable brand in the world is... You know? Amazon? Disney? Apple. Apple. Apple, Apple, that's a good one. Amazon yeah. is in the top 10. Apple is worth $249 billion. That's just the brand. Wow. That's not cash flow, inventory, assets, real estate, accounts receivables, anything else. That's just a brand. So build your brand. Mm-hmm. Trademarks are huge. Buyers will pay a lot more money for trademarks. The, the mistake that most business owners make, though, is they go and they, they set up their business in their state and then they get a state trademark, but they never check the federal mm-hmm. database to make sure that that company name is available. So they can be in business for years and years and years. And all of a sudden receive a cease and desist letter and they have to stop using that company name. So you don't want to go through that process and rebrand all over again. So make sure you spend the $1,500 to $2,000 and get the federal trademark. You should trademark your company name, your slogan, your logo, your podcast, John. Is your podcast federally trademarked? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so trademarks are huge. Um, also products. If you have some exclusive products, then get a trademark for those. We're selling a company that has um, their clients are grocery store chains and they have a different product for each grocery store chain and they're exclusive to that grocery store trade. And each one has a federal trademark. Pans are another big one. You know, every shark on shark tank always asks the same question. Do you have a patent on that? Do you have a patent pending? And a lot of times our offers are contingent upon the patent. And we once sold a company for $18 million. It was not making that much money, but they had 18 patents. Wow. And then wow. the other big thing is contracts, manufacturing contracts, franchisors contracts, you know, vending contracts, um, any type of vendor contracts, exclusive, exclusivity contracts. Client contracts are the most valuable of them all. Mm. But the problem with client contracts is most business owners forget the two sentence transferability clause mm. and 99.9% of all sales are asset sales. So if a buyer is not going to agree, you know, to do a stock sale and the client won't sign a consent to transfer, then your deal could stop dead in its tracks. Mm. So also if you have a recurring revenue model or subscription model, that's extremely valuable too. And will get you a much higher multiple. Celebrity endorsements are big, radio personality endorsements, you know, like Glenn Beck, Oprah Winfrey, and they can only endorse one vertical at a time. They're only going to do one skincare at a time. Mm -hmm. If they do anything more than that, they lose credibility. Mm -hmm. Online presence is huge. You know, if you got any of those top positions on Amazon, Wayfair, Etsy, those are huge positions that strategists and competitors will pay more money for. All right. So proprietary, then patrons. Patrons, patrons is, the is our customer base. 
So most businesses follow the 80-20 rule, where 80% of their revenue comes from 20% of their clients. What happens when you lose a client? A lot of businesses have customer concentration. We um, were once selling a media advertising business that had five clients, only five, John. Wow. <laughs> but they cater to casinos. And we were selling it in the $10 million range. Mm. So during the process, out of the five, they lost two clients. Oh, wow. The revenue dropped and their, their EBITDA dropped. So mm. they weren't sellable anymore. We ended up mm. having to merge them with another media company. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So and profits is last. Profits. Profits. Not last but not least, of course. Well, the reason I put them last is because profits, lack of profits is never the problem. It's never the issue. Lack of profits are not the problem. It's a symptom of not having one of the other five Ps. Mm. Clients come to me all the time and say, Michelle, I have a profit problem. I'm like, no, you have a people problem. No, you have a mm. process problem. Mm. So it's one of those other ones that leads to it. All right. So that's absolutely that's that's great. Is, and then is, is that the whole the STGPS exit model, or is there a, a different element to that? Term. No, that's the six P. So that's the SCGPS P. exit model. Would you like me to go over that? I'd love to. So that's, I always tell my clients, listen, <laughs> you got to have a plan. You know, business owners don't plan to fail. They don't plan to fail and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to become one of 70% of businesses going out of business and exiting more. They fail to plan. When you want to drive somewhere, the first thing you do is you pull out your phone, you go to Google Maps, and what do you plug in? Address of where you want to go. That's right. Your destination, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you're driving aimlessly around and yeah. up nowhere. Well, that's what business owners do. They drive around in circles. They drive up and down the financial hills to wind up nowhere because they don't have a destination. You need an end game. You need your desired sales price. I always tell my clients, pick a number. And I always get stuck on a number, John. They're always like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what number. And I'm like, just pick a number. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and, uh, so let's say 20 million. Let's say you want to sell your company for 20 million. Great. Now, what does the GPS need to know other than destination? It needs to know where you're starting from. What is your current valuation? Most business owners have never had a business evaluation done on their business. They have no idea what their business is worth. It's crazy. It's financial suicide. I mean, we go to the doctor, make sure our heart's still ticking and we're still kicking. You know, we take our cars to the mechanic to make sure it's in good shape, but we don't get an annual business valuation checkup. Mm. It's financial suicide because there are events, John, that increase valuation and events that decrease valuation. So this mm. is imperative to get a financial checkup every year, evaluation checkup. So let's say you're starting from five million. You want to sell for 20 million, you're starting at five million. Now you need a no time frame. Let's say you want to do it in 15 years. Great. Now you have a plan. Mm -hmm. Now you need to figure reverse engineer and say, okay, well, who's my buyer is going to be? Now notice I say buyers, not buyer. Because I have clients that come to me all the time and say, Michelle, I've already got the buyer. I just need you to represent it, represent mm -hmm. me. And I'm like, let's put it on the market because I guarantee you that buyer is going to fall apart. And then you have no backup buyers. Plus, how can I maximize value if I have one buyer? Hmm. Not creating any competition. Yeah, yeah. So how important is that? How important is that having multiple buyers? It's, it's extremely important. It's extremely important for a lot of reasons. If you have one buyer and that buyer falls apart during due diligence, and I will tell you, in all likelihood, it will probably fall apart. Mm. Then you have no backup buyers. Mm. Plus, if I'm bringing multiple buyers who are very interested and they see the value of the synergies, then we can create a bidding war and get a higher price. Yeah. And how do you do that without offending one of the buyers or making them feel like you're playing them? Well, there's different ways. There's a structured auction and a structured auction. All the buyers know the rules. You know, they know that there's a time frame that's 30 days, typically 30 days they have to give their, their best and final bid, you know, um, along with the terms, the seller might come back and, and tweak something, you know, that maybe they like this bid, but there's a couple of minor things they don't like about it, but that's a structured auction. The other ones that I do unstructured is where we get a lot of buyers that are giving us LOIs and I let them know up front that my seller or my client's going to go through each LOI and decide which, what they think is best for them. Hmm. It's not always about price. Other factors. There's other factors. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. back to that GPS exit model. So you know the price, $20 million. You know you look, you're worth $5 million. You want to do it in 15 years. Now you need to know who your buyers are going to be. There's five different types of buyers. 
So who your buyers are not going to be is a first-time buyer because they buy small businesses. Turnaround specialists buy distressed assets, and they're not going to be your buyer. So it will probably be a PEG, which is a private equity group, or a strategic slash competitor. They typically pay the highest multiple because they're buying synergies mm -hmm. to take advantage of economies of scale. And a lot of time, because they have the infrastructures already in place, they can reduce overhead from day one of buying the company. Mm -hmm. And then you have your sophisticated serial entrepreneurs that are industry agnostic and they chase EBITDA. So those are your five types of buyers. And you need to know, well, where's the numbers got to be? If I want to sell my company for $20 million, what's my gross revenues have to be, my, my profit margins? Most importantly, what does the EBITDA need to be? The EBITDA is going to have to be between $3 million to $5 million to sell for $20 million. Right, right. Now, and there then, are some businesses that have, have um, you know, are reinvesting their profits um, for a few years in order to grow, correct? And so that might affect what their EBITDA is. Right. Right. So you take, that, take that into account, I imagine. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So, so you take that into account then if their EBITDA is lower because they've been plowing their profits back in in order to grow faster. Well, when we look at EBITDA, we normalize the financials and we add back all personal expenses and then non-recurring. So we add back what we can. If it's on the balance sheet, obviously it's not an add back, but, but it still has value because it's on the balance sheet. It's an asset on the bal balance sheet. So it will increase value by being an asset. Uh, and in addition, you know, if a lot of people do put, business owners do put money back in, but some of those things we can add back because it's a non-reoccurring. Mm, got it. Um, anything else to add on the STGPS uh, exit model? Uh, my last thing was, my two last things was, um, once you determine the buyers and then where your financials have to be, then you want to really do some research and figure out well, what synergies are they buying? What are they looking for? You know, or are they mostly interested in the team? Or are they mostly interested in buying databases? You know, that was another thing I forgot to tell you under proprietary is databases. Mm -hmm. You know, Facebook paid $19 billion for, for WhatsApp and WhatsApp was hemorrhaging, but they had a synergy. They had a billion users and they knew they could ROI and get a return on their investment and monetize on that purchase because of the billing users. So um, anyway, so knowing what those synergies are that those buyers are willing to pay top dollar for. And then the last step in a GPS exit model is knowing your why. You know, none of us really do anything in life without a powerful why. You know, if it was easy to sell a business for $20 million, everyone would be doing it, right? Sure. It's not easy. So the why has to be strong enough, powerful enough to keep you in the game and keep you weathering the financial storms. Well, Michelle, this has been great. Exit Rich, the 6P method for selling your business for a huge profit. Where can people go to learn more about you? Yep. So I would encourage everyone to go get Exit Rich and they can go to exitrichbook.com. The book launches in June, but you don't have to wait till June. You can buy the book today and you can start reading it immediately. We are giving extra bonuses for anyone that buys the book before June. So if you go to exitrichbook.com, $24.79, we will email you the digital download immediately. We will send the hardcover to your doorstep to anyone that lives in the United States, no additional cost. We will give you a lifetime membership into the Exit Rich Book Club, and it has video content, and we talk about different strategies and techniques, plus documents. So all the documents to run your business and documents to sell your business. So we have sample LOIs. Uh, we have, well, let's start with running your business, sample policy and procedure books, uh, organizational charts, employee handbooks, non-competes. To sell your business, we have sample letter of intent, sample purchase agreement, due diligence checklist, closing docs. All these documents would cost you over 30 grand if you had your attorney recreate them. And then we also are giving you a 30-day free membership into Club CEOs, which is an entrepreneur mastermind. But we work with business owners to help them, first and foremost, build a sustainable business on the 6P so it's scalable and when you're ready, sellable. Wow, that's, that's a great deal. People ought to jump on that. Uh, Michelle, this has been wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Can I also tell your listeners to text Michelle to 888-526-5750 where all of my social media websites are. Follow me on social media and connect with me on LinkedIn. Excellent. All right. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Process Breakdown Podcast. Before you go, quick question. 
Do you want a tool that makes it easy to document processes, procedures, and or policies for your company so that your employees have all the information they need to be successful at their job? If yes, sign up for a free 14-day trial of Sweet Process. No credit card is required to sign up. Go to sweetprocess.com, sweet like candy, and process like process.com. Go now to sweetprocess.com and sign up for your risk-free 14-day trial. Hi, this is Owen, the CEO and co-founder here at Sweet Process. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast interview, uh, actually, you know what I want you to do? Go ahead and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That way we get more people aware of you know, the good stuff that you get here on this podcast. Again, go on to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. Looking forward to reading your review. Have a good day. That's my